Welcome to our second presentation on financial ratio analysis. Now, in this presentation, we're going to do some calculations, so have your calculator out. And also, you should have printed, or on your screen, so that you can get to them, the financial statements for Ford that are on the class website, or you can go to Yahoo or any other place where you want to download them. And we are looking at the year end, which is December 31st, uh, 2015. And we normally do this because it just makes life a little bit easier. If you look at the quarterly statements, you have to, you know, realize it's only three months. So it's never been a problem whenever I've used these examples. Well, this time it was a problem, <laughs> as we'll see in a minute. Not in a minute, we'll see in a little bit. And uh, I'll show you that we really, sh and I, I always tell, I always re remind students that we really should be looking at the quarterly data, uh, the most up-to-date data. But still, it's it, it, it's an interesting uh, ac exercise to actually see a situation where where things are <clears throat> changed drastically on the, uh, the balance sheet in this case. So let's start on slide number 20 with the profitability ratios. And these financial ratios measure a firm's returns by relating profits to sales, profits to equity, profits to assets. They're very popular. There's the net profit margin, also called the after-tax profit margin, gross margin, operating margin, return on assets, and return on equity, also called return on investment. So you ready to get started? Let's take a look. The net profit margin takes our net income, remember that's the bottom line on the cash flow statement, and it relates it to the total revenue. So if we take a look at the income statement, you, at the bottom line, the net income is uh, 7 billion 373 million. Do you see that? Do you see that on the on the balance on the income statement? The bottom line, net income, also called net profit. And you'll hear if you if you remember the the earnings calls, you might have heard people say the bottom line numbers. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the net income. Realizing that we really should go to the cash flow statement and and, and see, you know, see depreciation, but we're going to leave that out now. And then we divide that by total revenue. Well, what's total revenue? That's on the income statement, and that's the top line number, the annual sales, the net sales. And so you'll hear people talk about the top line, and they're talking about sales. Exactly. Exactly. You, you, are, they a number, are, are these numbers starting to make sense? <laughs> are these words starting to make sense? And you can also have at your disposal the, the formula sheet, but you don't need it because it's in the presentation, but you can have the formula sheet at your disposal. And so do you find the total revenue? Well, last year, 2015, it was almost $150 billion that they, that, that they uh, sold. Remember, that's not what they made. It's their car companies. They're highly capital intensive. So we're looking at 149,558. But you have to multiply that by a thousand, so it's not 149 million. It's 149 billion dollars, 558 million, 558 million. So, if we do that calculation, we divide the bottom line by the top line, we get about five percent, 4.93. Is that high? Is that low? I don't know. You got to look at their competitors. That's uh, pretty typical. If you go look at GM and look at some of the other car companies, that's pretty typical because it's, it, it's very expensive to run a car company, folks. And then you'll notice in, under the key statistics, if you use Yahoo, that they report a different number. They report 5.45%. Hmm. Now, why is it different? Well, if you look at the... the uh, number on Yahoo, if you look at the uh, the uh, key statistics using the Canadian Yahoo, not the destroyed American Yahoo, uh, United States Yahoo, 
you'll see it says TTM, TT, trailing 12 months. So they're doing what we really should be doing. We really should be looking at the quarterly data and going back four quarters, going back 12 months. But eh, we don't need to do that. It, you can do it on your own, but just for instructional purposes, it just makes for more work. That's all. And we're not going to do that. But that's why the number's a little different. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So make sure you've done it. It's not hard, folks. It's not hard. You can do it. Slide number 22. Gross margin. Well we'll see that there are gross profits, gross earnings on our income statement, and we're going to relate that to the total revenue. So if we take a look at the gross profit, do you see where it is on the income statement? It's the third number down. If you've taken accounting or managerial accounting, you know what these numbers mean. If not, don't worry about it because you don't don't have to create them. They're already there for us to do, to look at. And you see that, sure, Ford sold $149 billion, almost $150 billion worth of cars and trucks, but it cost them $126, almost and a half billion dollars to make those trucks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, cars are very uh, capital intensive. And so they wound up with a gross profit of a little over $23 billion, 23063 Do you see that? If not, I want you to stop right now and get a hold of that income statement and peruse it so that you feel more comfortable with it because you're probably going, oh, where is he, where is he? Make sure you understand where I is, where I am, where I'm going to be because you need to be there with me. <laughs> okay, so if we take the gross profit, that third number from the top, and divided by the top line, we get a gross margin of 15.42, which, uh, you know, is sounds pretty good. But we have to look at our competitors. We can't just look at this company, one company, in a vacuum. We have to see, well, how does it compare to other companies? Make sense? And this is not one of the statistics that Yahoo uh, displays, but other websites will have it, others won't. The higher the better, obviously, but we have to take a look at our competitors to, to determine if this is a good number, if it's something that pleases us or something that doesn't please us. Remembering that it's just one number that out of many to look at. Slide 23, the operating margin. This one is in Yahoo. This one is in uh, Canada's Yahoo Key Statistics uh, webs, web page for Ford. And this is looking at the rate of profit, profit being earned from the net income, adjusting for the non-cash items. So what we're going to do is look at the operating income or loss. And so what we have to do is we have to go down the income statement to find operating income. And we see that we take out the selling general and administrative. Do you remember the, the um, S, A, and O? Sales, administrative, and operating expenses from the earnings calls. And these people just bark off these acronyms, S, A, and O, as if everybody understands them. You know, it took me a while to, f oh yeah, I think I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the administrative expenses. Because, right, Ford needs websites and they need a, a distribution system and they need all kinds of what is called overhead or burden. Some people use the term burden because it's a huge multinational organization. So there on our uh, section on operating expenses, we get to take out almost fifth, well, a little over fifteen billion dollars in operating expenses, and notice that for some reason they don't bother to total it up. They they let you do that. They just leave it blank. I don't know why, but they don't. And we get an operating income of seven billion six hundred forty-seven million dollars. Right? You you understand? Okay, good. So we divide that by the total revenue, the top line number, and we get a uh, operating margin of about five, a little over 5%, 5.11%. 5 
Trailing 12 months, according to Yahoo, is 5.93%. So things have gotten a little better for Ford in the prevailing, uh, I guess this would be quarter end of, uh, of uh, June, right? No, yeah, June 30th, right, right, exactly. So the, uh, well, September might co hasn't come out yet, I bet, but it will come out soon, I'm sure. Okay, so that was the operating margin. And as we say at the bottom of the, the slide here on slide 23, the higher the better. It varies greatly from industry to industry. So when we're looking at a specific company, we always need to look at its competitors within the industry, just as we did with the price to earnings ratio in the previous presentation. When we find a company that is atypical of its competitors in an industry, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not, Hey, we found it. This is the reason we're going to buy it or sell it. No, it's a single signal that we have more investigative work to do. Are you with me? Okay. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at two very important ones, return on assets and return on equities. Um, many people like this. Warren Buffett likes, he has his own little version of this. He tweaks it a little bit, but it's the same idea. It shows how a profitable a company, a company is relative to its total assets. So you take the net income, which we find on the uh, income statement, the bottom line, remember the net income, the net profit, that's the bottom line. And we divide it by the total assets. The, wait a minute, that, that's on the balance sheet, right? So we're relating our income to the assets that the company needs to support its operations. It reveals how effective the company is in generating profits from the assets it has available. And of course, the higher the better. So if we take that bottom line number, 7373, $7 dollars and we divide that by the total assets. We have to go to the balance sheet. Can you find that on the balance sheet? Total assets? $224 billion, $295 million, right? It's a big number. Well, if we do that, we get a return on assets of 3.28%. Is that typical for cars, companies? Eh, yeah, because they're so capital intensive. And I keep using that phrase. What does it mean? It means that it takes a whole lot of money to and assets to run a car company, right? There's a reason why no car company in the last uh, 80 years, is it, has succeeded in surviving. There's one that's doing it now. We'll see how long it lasts, and that's Tesla. But all the others, all the other new car startups have just fallen by the wayside, right? Exactly, because it's, it's not an easy business to break into, right? Okay. So, so if we go to Yahoo, we see that the return on assets is 2.53%. So a little bit lower than it was at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to take a look at the counterpart, return on equity, return on investment. This is similar to the return on assets, but instead of using the total assets, it just uses the total stockholders' equity. In other words, it takes out the debt. You see? So we're looking at what's left over. After you take assets minus liabilities, you have stockholders equity. In the 121 class, we called it net worth. And so this is a measure of the overall profitability of a company in relation to the equity, the shareholders equity. Well, it's, it's calculated very similarly. We take the net income, that bottom line number, but instead of dividing it by the total assets, we divide it by the total stockholders' equity. And because, let's read together at the bottom of the slide here, because return on equity uses stockholders' equity instead of total assets for the denominator, return on equity is very sensitive to the amount of debt a company is carrying. Specifically, if a company carries a great amount of debt, the return on equity will be much larger than the return on assets. The saying is, you are all using other people's money to make your money. Well, some investors think this is a good thing, especially real estate investors. <laughs> 
Others, investors are worried about the possible negative consequences of too much debt. Well, if you're a car company, folks, you carry a lot of debt. So if you look at the equity, the stockholder's equity on the balance sheet, you'll find that it's much less than the total assets. Only $28.5 billion, $28 billion, $642 million. So when you divide the total um, net income by the total shareholder's equity, you wind up with a return on equity of 25.74%. Make sure you do it. Make sure you get it right. Which is, wow. Well, why is that? It's because car companies have so much debt. They carry so much debt on the books. And if you look at the trailing 12 months from Yahoo, you'll find that it's gone up 29.4%. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, this is a dual-edged sword. A lot of debt makes your return on equity look great because you're using other people's money to make your money. But if you can't make your debt payments right, and uh, later on, later on, later on, we're going to take a look at some um, uh, ratios that see how easy it is or how well the company can service that debt, okay? <laughs> okay, good, excellent. So those, dear students, are the profitability ratios. Uh, play with those, and you're gonna calculate some on your own in the assignment. The liquidity ratios. The liquidity, now what's liquidity, right? That's day-to-day, -day, right? Soon, thing, being able to turn uh, ca investments into cash or how much cash you have on, and the financial ratios concern, are concerned with a firm's ability to meet its day-to-day -day operating expenses and satisfy its short-term obligations as they come due. In other words, can we make payroll? Can we pay the rent? Can we pay the debt? The current ratio is very popular, and so is the acid test ratio, the quick ratio, it's sometimes called. The net working capital really is a bit of an... Uh, anomaly here. It's a little bit of a of a of a, of a outlier outlier because it's really not a ratio. It's it's a it's a hard and fast number, and you don't see too many people using that. At least I haven't. But it's 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 a it's a hard number that we'll take a look at. It. It's the it's basically the current ratio without the ratio. It's looking at it from a dollar standpoint. So let's take a look at these. They're not hard to do, folks. In fact, you can look up the current ratio on Yahoo, it's there for you to look up. It's, as we say on slide 27, one of the more popular financial measures. And it's very simple. We take our total current assets and we divide them by our current liabilities. And remember, in the accounting world, current means anything that is one year or less. The current ratio is a good indicator of how stable a company is. Anything above one is considered acceptable because you can you, know, you can make your payments within the next year. If your current assets equal or exceed your current liabil liabilities, you should be able to satisfy your short-term obligations without any problems. Obviously, the greater the number is, the better, until, until you get to situations like Microsoft, which had the current ratio in the hundreds. I mean, they just, they had very little debt and had cash coming out of their ears and they finally said, all right, all right, we'll pay dividends. They didn't want to pay dividends because they didn't want people to think they weren't growing anymore, a growth company. It was, uh, it was, it was kind of a, a bit of a joke in the investment community, but it, but it was serious because we're talking big money. I mean, Microsoft, the first dividend, I think, was a $3 one-time dividend in 2003. So if you, can you find, these are on the balance sheet. Can you find the total current assets or current assets? Can you find the current liabilities or total current liabilities? On the Yahoo, it says total current liabilities. Um, yeah, you can. And you'll see that the current assets are quite substantial. $145 billion, or right? a little and a half, $145 billion, $470 million. And the current liabilities are only $20 billion, $272 million. So that gives us a current ratio of over 7, 7.176. Make sure you do it. Make sure you do it. 
wow, yeah, Ford can meet its, its obligations very easily, right? So when we go to Yahoo, it says 1.24. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Something ain't right. Well, this is the danger of not looking at the quarterly data. I looked at that and I said, wait a minute, something's not right. And I thought, hmm. So I go to the quarterly data and sure enough, sure enough, what happened in that quarter between March of 31st, 2016, and June 30th of 2016. Well, some, actually quite a bit, of their long-term debt became due and became short-term debt. Exactly. So it went from long-term to short-term, and the current liabilities ballooned to, uh, what is it here? I have it here, $89.5 billion dollars from 20 billion. So probably that was some aftermath of the financial crisis. I didn't investigate that. We, this is something we would definitely need to investigate, folks. We if we were Ford analysts, we'd want to make sure we understood what happened to that uh uh long-term debt and became becoming short-term debt and whether or not, well, obviously Ford's still going to pay it. The current ratio is still above 1. They can still pay it, but it's something that we as as potential investors in Ford should really understand and be aware of. You see, so so this is does it mean we're not going to buy them? Does it mean we're going to buy them? No, no, no. It's, this is one thing we're learning. One thing, one piece of the story that we're learning. One piece of the puzzle. Okay, good, good. So now let's take a look at slide twenty-eight, because the networking capital is not a ratio. <laughs> it's simply the current ratio in absolute dollar terms. You take the current assets, and instead of dividing them by current liabilities, you subtract current liabilities. So if your current assets are greater than your current liabilities, then the number will be positive. If they're less than, the number will be negative, and of course, if they're the same, it'll be zero. So it gives you an idea of how much absolute dollars you have above and beyond your current liabilities. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I don't see it used that much, folks. I re I don't really see it used that much. But I guess people who are really worried, okay, great, you got a you got a a, 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 a current ratio above one. How much dollars do you have above the amount of current liabilities? So you can calculate that. And it, it, you just take the um, current assets minus the current liabilities, and you'll get your networking capital. So can you do that? You did that on your own, okay, right? I'm not going to, well, I could do it for you. But no, I'm not, I'm going to ask you to do it. You can do it. Okay. Slide number 29. Where are we? Here we are. Slide 29. Now, ooh, this one sounds scary, doesn't it? The acid test ratio. They're also called the quick ratio. Well, this is a more stringent version, a more rigorous version of the current ratio. Why? Because it excludes inventory. If you look at the balance sheet, you'll see that your current assets are made up of cash and cash equivalents, meaning, you know, uh, corporate paper and, and the like. Short-term investments, accounts receivable, inventory, and other current assets. Well, if you take out the inventory, what you're saying is, look, who knows? Well, cars, you know, cars are always going to sell. Even if they're last year's models, they're going to sell. But say you have a, a computer company. Last year's models, forget it, right? <laughs> forget it. So, so this, this acid test ratio measures the ability of the company to meet its short-term obligations even if its current inventory becomes obsolete or undesirable and hence difficult or impossible to be turned into cash. Do you, under, do you understand? So you take the cash plus the accounts receivable plus the short-term investments plus the other current investments and you divide that by the current liabilities. Alternatively, you could just take the current assets and subtract the inventory. That, that's a little easier. But let's say that all of a sudden these cars are just, nobody wants to buy these cars. They all want the new cars. Can Ford still, how is easy is it for Ford to still 
meet their obligations. And it turns out it, it's they can still do it. It's still the the acid test ratio is well above one for even if we do take the um, the uh, the inventory out. So so do that. Do it, play with it. Uh, using the 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 um, the yearly data we get with we get six point seven six six. But I'll let you take out the eight billion dollars worth <laughs> eight billion dollars worth of inventory. Cars just sitting. See, that's interesting. You know, this Dell Computer Corporation, they're very smart. And they, you know, computer companies, boy, they don't want to be left with all, yet last year's model for computers. And so Dell was the first company, everybody does it now. They built the computer and waited until they got, they designed it, you know, created, you know, the first few just to make sure it worked and everything and tested it. But they didn't build any inventory until people started buying it. It's called just in time, exactly. So they waited until people would order it, and then they build it and send it to them. And of course, you know, it's uh, it makes for its own problems uh, if you can't deliver what people are asking for. But still, it it it, it was everybody does it now in the computer industry because they don't want to be left with computers that are six months old because they're pff, they're obsolete. Okay, so those were the liquidity ratios. Slide number 30, the activity ratios. Uh, these are financial ratios that are used to measure how well a firm is managing its assets. So we look at accounts receivable turnover, inventory turnover, total asset turnover, and we use both the balance sheet and the income statement. The activity ratios measure a firm's ability to convert different accounts within their balance sheets into cash or sales. Companies will try to turn their production into cash or sales as fast as possible. Why? Because this will generally lead to higher revenues. And uh, make sure you have the balance sheet and the income statement with you because let's take a look at the accounts receivable turnover. Uh, what um, uh, Yahoo and the balance sheet calls them net receivables. Well, what are accounts receivables? You accountants know what that means. It means money coming into the bill into the co company, money coming into the building, right? Coming into the corporation. And if you look at Ford, whoa, almost 102 billion dollars was owed to them by whom? By the dealerships, right? Because they go through the dealerships, and the dealerships are always um, you know, taking the, the the company the. Uh, uh, cars and trucks and then selling them and then you know basically paying afterwards uh so so ford is is owed a lot of money from these dealers in this case if we take the total revenue the the top line number divided by our accounts receivable we get an accounts receivable turnover of 1.467 and that's kind of low but it if we look at other car companies we'll find that it's you know, very similar. It indicates the return a company is getting from its investments in accounts receivable. Because by maintaining accounts receivable, firms are indirectly extending interest-free loans to their clients. A high ratio implies that the company operates either on a cash basis, in which case they don't, you know, they don't, nobody owes them anything. I want money right now. Or its extension of credit and collection of accounts receivable is efficient. Yes, we, we want them to pay us quickly. A low ratio implies that the company should reassess its credit policies in order to ensure the timely collect collection of impaired, imparted credit, not earning interest for the firm. In other words, pay up, bums, you know, pay, pay us quickly. Well, but that might just be my how. It might just be how the industry operates, in the case of cars and defense industry. The defense, look, Uncle Sam does pay his debts, folks. This is a, a truism. General Dynamics is going to get paid for the aircraft carrier, and, and Lockheed Martin's going to get paid for the F-35 strike, whatever they're called, joint strike uh, fighters. But it takes a long time. And I remember I worked in the... Um, I worked in the industry was a million years ago, and people were always complaining about how slow they, the Defense Department paid. And I remember reading in the news that 
the company started to complain a lot. So like, come on, we got to pay our pay our our contractors. We got to pay our our vendors. We got to pay our employees. And so the defense department said, "Okay, we'll we'll speed it up a little bit." <laughs> All right, slide number 32, inventory turnover. Same idea, but instead of using our accounts receivable, we use the inventory. And of course, the higher the number, the better. The less time an item spends in inventory, the better, re the, better the return the company is able to earn from the funds tied up in inventory. As with all ratios, just a reminder, we must compare it against industry averages. A low turnover implies poor sales and therefore excess inventory. A high ratio either implies strong sales or we're not very effective in maintaining our, uh, maintaining our inventory. We just got too much of it, right? <laughs> high inventory levels are unhealthy because they represent an investment with a re rate of return of zero. And it also opens up the company to trouble in the case of falling prices or obsolete products. So in the case of cars, this is a typical push me, pull you situation. You want to have cars on the lot so that it track, attracts customers, but you don't want to have too many cars on the lot because that's a lot of money just sitting there, not turned into revenue. And it turns out that the inventory turnover for Ford is actually pretty darn good, considering how much and you know how much these things are cost each one. It, if you take the total revenue divided by the inventory, you get about 18, 17.978. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. And so that means about 18 times a year, right? They're turning over that inventory, which is you know pretty darn good, considering you know the nature of that business. Again, we would compare it against other companies, other car companies to see how well they're doing. Slide 33, the total assets is the same idea, but this time we divide the total revenue into the total assets to see how well we are um, managing our total assets. So again, this number is quite low for, for a car company, but that's not unusual because they have so much assets needed to support the sales and, and the manufacturing of the cars. So the total asset turnover ratio measures the firm's efficiency at using assets to support sales and revenue. Higher the number, the better. Look at your competitors. Companies with low profit margins tend to have high asset turnovers, such as a, 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 a grocery store, right? They sell milk. You know, they only make a few pennies on every milk that they sell, but they sell it to you every week, every day, every year. And those with high profit margins have a tendency to have low asset turnover. And so we see that in the car company. The asset turnover is 0.6649, a very, very low by uh, other company standards. But by car company standards, we'd have to take a look at GM and and the others and see how they can how they compare all right so those are the activity ratios now these last ones the leverage ratios are ratios that were very near and dear to mr benjamin graham's heart because he was always worried about a company going bankrupt <laughs> and these leverage ratios are used to measure the amount of debt being used to support operations and the ability of the firm to service its debt. Exactly. And some of these might look familiar. Well, at least the debt to equity ratio. If you've taken business 121, uh, the financial planning and money management, we, we compute that ratio, right? We did that. And it's basically the same idea. How much debt? How much equity? Uh, the times interest earned. This was the one that Mr. Graham was always interested in. How often, how many times a year do you, do you earn your interest payments so you can make them. If you can't make your interest payments, you're in deep trouble. And then the total debt to total assets. We're going to use this term leverage um, later on. Uh, we use it in real estate quite a bit, so it comes back often. Debt is often referred to as leverage. The idea is that you're using other people's money to make money. 
you are using the borrowed money as a lever to increase your earnings. When one firm buys another firm using borrowed money, it is often referred to as a leveraged buyout. We're going to see this uh, when we get to margining, buying on margining, and real estate. This is this is the way you live and die in real estate with with leverage. So. Some people think this is great. You know, hey, we're using other people's money to make our money. Or some people are worried about the possible potential uh, problems <laughs> that can come from having too much debt and not being able to service that debt. The debt to equity ratio is a measure of a company's financial leverage calculated by dividing long-term debt by shareholders' equity. It indicates what proportion of equity and debt the company is using to finance its assets. And for Ford, this was very high in the beginning of this year. And it's come down quite a bit because now their long-term debt is a lot smaller because a lot of it moved into the short-term debt, the current debt column. <laughs> So uh, if you take the long-term debt, which is what was $132, almost $133 billion at the beginning of 2016, the end of 2015, and you divide it by their total stockholders' equity of 28, 20, almost 20, 28.5 billion, 28.642 billion, you get a debt-to-equity debt -to ratio, which is 45 you know, 400%, which, you know, some <laughs> some companies would have a heart attack when that happened, but that's just typical for the car companies, no big deal. Now, it's come down quite a bit. I'll leave you to uh, take a look at the June 30th, uh, 2016 balance sheet and calculate it. Why? Because a lot of that long-term debt rolled into the short-term column, which means Ford has had to pay that, or has to pay that within the next year. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's continue. Oh, let's read. We didn't read this at the bottom. A higher debt to equity ratio generally means that a company has been aggressive in financing its growth with debt. This is car com This is how car companies live and die, folks. This can result in lower earnings as a result of the additional interest expense. And sometimes investors only use interest-bearing long-term debt instead of total liabilities. I don't think that's a very good idea, but that means you never pay off your debts. I don't understand that one, but you decide. And of course, the lower, the better, unless you're a car company in which you're saddled with tremendous amounts of debt. Slide number 36. Now, here's the one I, I told you was Mr. Graham's favorite here. When you, when, when you read The Intelligent Investor, and then maybe eventually security analysis, you'll see that he really likes this one. Times interest earns. This measures the ability of a company to meet its fixed interest payments. What? In other words, how many times per year do you earn the interest that you have to pay? You take the interest before the, I'm sorry, the earnings before interest and taxes, excuse me, and you divide that by the interest expense. So anywhere, you know, three or four, every three or four months, you, you earn your interest is usually considered fine, right? Well, it turns out that Ford earns their interest 14 times a year. Do the calculation, you get 14.26, which means every three or four weeks, you know, not quite, um, they, they are able to pay off their interest for the year. So is Ford in danger of being hauled off the bankruptcy court anytime soon? No, Ford's doing fine. Thank you very much with regard to their interest payments, that is. And Mr. Graham loved this one. He's always looking at this, this one right here. Slide 37, our last but not necessarily least uh, ratio, is the total debt to total assets. You take your total liabilities and you divide it by your total assets and that includes long term and short term, right? And that is in the, in Ford's case, the total liabilities are 196 billion 189 and you divide that by the total assets 224 billion 925 and you get 87%, which is pretty high, folks. But again, in the car business, eh. 
If it varies substantially from the debt to equity ratio, the company may be relying heavily on short term debt. A heavy reliance on short term debt can denote more risk. Unless in the case of Ford, you can pay it all off because you have plenty of cash on hand, which they do. So in this case, it's not a problem for Ford. They can make their debt payments and they're in no danger of going through bankruptcy like as they were in 2008 and 2009 when all three car companies were in big trouble and GM and Chrysler did go through bankruptcy and accepted the, uh, the loans from, from the government. Whereas Ford did everything they could to avoid bankruptcy and everything they could to, uh, to not take any uh, money from the government. And it was a stroke of genius. Mr. Mullally, who, who has since retired, he hocked the Ford emblem, you know, the, 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 the fanciful F with the, with the oval. He put that in the pawn shop. Believe it or not, folks, I know it's hard to believe. But he begged, borrowed, and stole every dime he could to make sure he didn't have to take any money from the government. And it was a stroke of genius. People would, you know, old, old geezers like me would go onto a Ford lot and say, I've owned GM cars for the last 40 years, but I ain't never buying another government motors car in my life. I'm going to buy me a Ford because you didn't take no bailout from the government. It was genius. Now, he knew very well that if Ford, I'm sorry, if GM and Chrysler had gone under, Ford would have gone under. Why? Because all the suppliers that supply parts to GM and Chrysler would have gone under, gone under and they also supply the, the parts to Ford. You know, the car make, makers don't make everything about the car. They don't make the airbags. They don't make the catalytic converters. They don't make the, the injectors. They, 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 they make some things, but they mostly put the car together. And so <laughs> they designed it, certainly. And so, um, uh, they knew that they they were you know they're rooting for GM and Chrysler not to go under because that would have spelled their demise also. And I don't know if you remember, but there were a lot of people who were saying, "Let them go under, let them go, let them." We don't need a car industry. <laughs> you know, you that's the problem with an industry that employs several million people throughout the country. You can't just let it die, and then say, "Okay." That was not a good idea. Let's bring it back. It doesn't work that way, folks. You And you don't have two $17 trillion economies that you can play with and see what would happen. Okay, well, let's see. Well, this one, we'll leave the car companies. We'll, we'll bail them out. This one, we won't. And we'll see what... It doesn't... That's the problem with economics. It's not called the dismal science for nothing. So did you enjoy the financial? No, they're not as exciting as the dividend discount models, in my humble opinion, but they're another piece of the puzzle, another part to the, to the story, another a chapter in the story. And it's something we need to look at, realizing that it's just more information. So you see we're coming down off the mountain here, folks. And uh, the dividend discount models, the cash flow, discounted cash flow models, in my humble opinion, are the pinnacle. It allows you to, to look at vistas that you unheard of, unseen before. And now, <clears throat> in our next uh, couple of chapters, we're going to really go down, down, and down into some important information, but a whole lot of silliness. When we take a look at investor psychology and market behavior, investor behavior, and technical analysis <laughs> so be prepared for some some quite interesting things but also some silliness when we come back and and deal with our last two chapters on stocks chapter seven and chapter eight now go back and do these the assignments really pretty easy folks all you gotta do is pick 12 make sure you don't pick all of the of the the one type you know two of each three of each and cut two companies that you really like and have fun with it. Use your spreadsheet if you like or just your calculator. See ya!